Great. So it's a, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Sangsek Lee here today, and he's going to tell us about uh, a model of quantum gravity with immersion spacetime. Please go ahead, Sangsek. Okay. Uh, it's great to uh, present this work, uh, and thank you for uh, joining in. So, uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, a model of uh, gravity with immersion spacetime. Uh, this is the uh, reference. So if you have a question, please uh, interrupt anytime. Um, so in uh, general relativity, uh, we learned that uh, geometry is dynamical. That is the origin of the gravity. Now in the realm of uh, quantum gravity and if uh, quantum fluctuations of uh, geometry, then presumably, uh, there's no well-defined notion of topology and dimension either. So, so therefore we, we may want to think about theory of uh, quantum gravity where not only geometry, but also topology and dimension are also dynamical. So in, in trying to construct such theory, we also uh, take the lesson that we learned from ADS-CFT where um, uh, geometry is uh, nothing but some collective uh, variable of uh, underlying quantum matter. So here, the goal of today's talk is to construct a concrete model of quantum gravity where this dimension topology and geometry are all collective variables that capture some pattern of entanglement on the underlying quantum matter. So that is the uh, motivation and, and the goal. So without further uh, deal, let me just jump in, jump into the main topic. So, so uh, roughly is the, today's discussion is uh, divided into three sections. First, I will talk about kinematic structure. And then the central part is specifying the gauge symmetry, uh, which determines the dynamics in, in the constrained system as in general relativity. And, and finally, some dynamical consequences of, of the theory. So uh, first kinematic thing. So the fundamental degree freedom of the theory is a real rectangular matrix. So it's a N by L real matrix phi. So here, A, the row index runs from one to N. And I, the index, run from one to L. And I'm going to refer to row index A as a flavor and column index I as site because I'm going to regard this uh, column index to represent a point in, in, in some spatial manifold. But for now, let's just take this as a M by L matrix. Now, the total Hilbert space is spanned by this basis state, uh, cat of phi. This is just the eigenstate of this uh, uh, operator phi hat, whose eigenvalue is the label for this basis state. It's like the position eigenstate in this, uh, for this matrix uh, operator. And then we, we uh, use the standard inner product for those, uh, for those uh, scalars, okay? Now, um, now this total Hilbert space can be viewed in the following way. So if I interpret this each column index i uh, as site, then uh, we can view this uh, M by L matrix as being a collection of uh, L site, and at each side, there are M scalars, okay? That's just another way of looking at this uh, M by L rectangular matrix. And then, uh, then total Hilbert space can be decomposed into a direct product of local Hilbert space, HI, where HI is the Hilbert space spanned by those uh, scalar 
column I for, for all, all possible flavor, okay? And uh, one, one choice of decomposition like this is called, uh, I'm going to call frame. But, you know, frame is not unique. Uh, you can decompose the total Hilbert space in, in different ways. For example, I can apply uh, a special linear L by L transformation, the right multiplication to this uh, matrix to define uh, another M by L matrix in a, in a rotated frame. And then I can uh, define the local Hilbert space uh, in this uh, rotated size, capital I, okay? And then uh, it's easy to check that the total Hilbert space can be equally well decomposed into uh, local Hilbert space in N, okay? With the same inner product. So, so, um, okay. So then, then a local Hilbert space, say, in this rotate frame, it's made of state that are uh, 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 a kind of linear proportion of state that are in multiple side in, in, the, in the original frame. Okay. Now, once we choose a frame, then now we can ask um, whether, whether uh, the state has a, a, any sense of loc locality or not. And then I'm going to say uh, a state has a local structure if the following conditions are satisfied. So first condition is that uh, there exists a mapping from site to a some well-defined uh, dimension topology and some sense of distance. Uh, and and more, more importantly, uh, now, now we can view this uh, quantum state defined on this side as being defined on this Riemannian manifold, right? Maybe more, more accurately on some lattice sitting on, on the Riemannian manifold. And then, uh, and then I say my state has a local structure if that state viewed as a state defined on the Riemannian manifold is short range entangled. So by this, I mean the following. So, uh, in, you know, some Riemannian manifold, short range entangled states are the one which, which exhibit the entanglement entropy, some boundary, boundary law of entanglement entropy, right? If you think about some subregion A, then for short range entanglement state, usually some, for example, the entanglement entropy of region A is proportional to the volume of the boundary. To the leading order in the in the in, in the uh, um, size. So then I say I choose some uh, partition of the original site. Say A is a subsystem. Then I ask myself, is this is the entanglement entropy between this region A and its complement? Is it going to be proportional to the volume of the boundary of the image of the the uh, region A in the Riemannian manifold, okay, to the leading order. And if this is the case for any choice of the subset, right, then, then I say the state has a local structure. Okay, of course, this is very stringent condition and uh, state that says are special states. Most states do not satisfy this condition, but this is my, uh, definition, okay? So what's special about the local structure is again, when we view it as a state defined on some Riemannian manifold, it's a short range entangled. Okay, and then now instead of uh, defining entanglement from, from the manifold here, what we are trying to do is to define the manifold in terms of entanglement, okay? That's the uh, motivation. So here are some examples of uh, states with or without local structure. So for simplicity, let us consider, consider a Gaussian state here, uh, which is labeled by T, okay? So here again, phi, phi cat is a basis state, and this is the wave function. 
and, and I have those in, into the I times trace of uh, T, which is a L by L complex matrix, and phi transpose the field, the matrix variable, which is a L by M matrix, and phi is a M by L matrix, right? So this trace is in component form is nothing but T i j phi i phi j with the flavor index a contracted, right? So this is just the Gaussian state. And this state is labeled by this L, L by L complex matrix. Now, if I choose, diff and then Tij, which, which I call entanglement bonds, kind of uh, determines which sides are connected, okay? And, uh, and depending on how I choose this bilocal object Tij, I have different state, okay? And uh, for example, uh, it's a mutual information between side i and j for this, this Gauss, Gaussian state. This is of course a function of t, and you can easily check that to the leading order, it is proportional to the magnitude of the, the, this tij that connects side i and j. Okay? So literally, this, uh, this t i j is the variable that quantifies the amount of entanglement between side i and j. Now, suppose I turn on this uh, tij bilocal link in this manner. So here, these black dots are site in, in a frame, and then these uh, links are the one uh, uh, where tij is non-zero for those pairs of site and say the thickness of the bond represent the magnitude of, of this Tij. So just as the atoms and molecules of solid and the heat and quantum information and, and uh, uh, they can be tra transported through the, those bonds. Here, this Tij is the um, bond that forms the chain of entanglement. And then uh, this state, say here has a one dimensional local structure as you can see it has a line structure and indeed for this state if you choose any subset of a site and then entanglement of the subset obeys the uh, uh, boundary law in the one dimensional manifold okay so in this sense this state has a one dimensional local structure and then for the same set of site i can turn on different entanglement bonds. Here, uh, it has a 2D structure. If you look at it carefully, it's nothing but uh, a square lattice. Okay. Topically, it's a square lattice. So in again here, if you choose any subset, then now the entanglement and entropy of the subset of site obey the uh, boundary law in 2D uh, space. And then if you just turn on random uh, link for all uh, pairs of site, then it has no local structure or, or we can say it has zero dimensional local structure. There's no extended uh, space. So in this sense, you, you see the, the uh, in, in this setting, the notion of dimension, topology and uh, distance as well is a dynamical property of, of state, right? So Sangsek, um, Sangsek, can I ask you something quickly? I mean. Sure, yeah. I mean, in order for this to be stable, uh, you would need this to be approximately a stationary state of some Hamiltonian or, I mean, the yeah. Hamiltonian would generically yeah. be time dependent, so it, it would get very uh, complicated. But is that the idea that you want this to, that you want to then put a condition that this be such a stationary state? Uh, um, I'm, I'm going to talk about the Hamiltonian a little bit later, but here, so I, I don't know the answer what what Hamiltonian, for which Hamiltonian this kind of state with a local structure is at least a locally minimum. And what 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 is the dynamical mechanism that stabilizes or favor states with the local structure? That that I don't know. Uh, but what I'm going to discuss later is uh, there is some choice of Hamiltonian which preserves, which is background independent, but preserves the local structure in the initial state. For example, for the same Hamiltonian, if, that, if 
we choose the initial state, the one dimensional local structure, that state remains one dimensional, remains to have a one dimensional local structure. And, and, and if you choose a state with a 2D local structure, then uh, that structure is maintained along the Hamiltonian evolution. Uh, but, but that's a good question that uh, the answer that I, I, I don't know how, yeah. In what sense is this state with local structure uh, favorable over other random state? I see. Well, actually, what you did say you're going to do is related to the question I was trying to ask. So that that might be that might yeah, be good. Yeah. Okay, um, I will. I will come. I didn't dis discuss any dynamics yet. This is just purely kinematic uh, structure. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. Um. So so now to define the dynamics we are asymmetry just as the in GR, all the dynamics is, uh, dynamical information is encoded in this uh, constraint, okay? So similarly, we, we are going to construct some um, uh, gauge group from, from starting from this uh, kinematic Hilbert space. So, so first, uh, let's think about the uh, spatial diffeomorphism. So in the general relativity, the so momentum- can I ask of... a quick question? Yeah, sure. Go going back to your previous slide, like. If you didn't know how you created this state, you didn't know this matrix Tij, someone just gave you the state, what, what would you do to figure out which of these three, like what, what concrete thing, what, what would be the concrete steps to decide which of these three, if any, is the situation you have? Sorry, what, what is given to me? Like, so you, someone just gives you this state without yeah. telling you how it was created. How do you figure out whether it has 1D structure or 2D structure or no structure? Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's related to this question. You, you look at the uh, pattern of entanglements. So for example, you in principle can compute the entanglement to entropy of any subset, right? You have a huge... If you don't know how to embed it in a, like you don't know what Riemannian thing to embed it into. Yeah, you don't, you don't know in priori, right? But then you ask yourself whether the entanglement data you compute is comparable with any uh, Riemannian manifold or not. I don't have a kind of step-by-step -step algorithm to figure out, I guess first question, is there any local structure or not? If so, what, what, what is the topology dimension and uh, metric of that Riemannian manifold? Yeah. Um, I don't have, a, I don't have a, like a, um, uh, step-by-step -step algorithm to figure that out. Here, I just to, want to give some intuitive, um, uh, some, some examples where, where, where there are uh, local structure. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so in GR, uh, momentum constraint generate the spatial diffeomorphism. So it comes with, uh, with uh, a shift vector. It's a vector field that basically specify the infinitesimal uh, local uh, translation. And just from kinematics, we know that the Poisson bracket between two momentum constraint is proportional to momentum constraint with the shift, which is given by lead derivative of the uh, shift with respect to another shift. Okay, this is, and, and then, but in GR, we consider the, the uh, uh, translation or differentism with a fixed dimension, right? But in our theory, well, in the theory that we want to construct, dimension is not predetermined. It's a, it's a part of dynamical data. Different state have a different dimension. So therefore, uh, we want to be able to capture, say, diffeomorphism in any dimension because some state can have uh, one dimensional structure, other state have two dimensional structure, etc. Right? So therefore, uh, we want to generalize the special diffeomorphism into a larger group that includes diffeomorphism in any dimension and any topology. So that's the first requirement. And then uh, second one uh, is that uh, we also want to include a map uh, that can take any given point to any other point within the within 
within the set because for any two given point, there is going to be a state where these two points are very close. If you, if you turn on very strong entanglement between those two points, then that means these two points are very close in terms of uh, proper distance, right? So the idea is that stronger entanglement between, between two points, there the distance between the point is, is, is closer. So in that sense, uh, for any two given points, uh, they can be very close. And then they should be, we should be able to say map that one point to another point under some smooth diffeomorphism. So that's why we want to include such uh, a transformation within our uh, generalized uh, 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 symmetry group. And then the group that achieved that is this uh, special linear L by L uh, transformation. And uh, this is the, the transformation that I talked about when I rotate the frame uh, before, when, when uh, a few slides ago. And here is the uh, generator, Hermitian generator written explicitly here. Pi is the conjugate momentum of phi. So pi is a L by N matrix valued operator and phi again is M by L. So this, this is a pi times phi is L by L matrix. And then Y here is a L by L matrix, which plays the role of shift uh, vector. So, but it's a tensor here. So I call this shift tensor. So the idea is that this uh, uh, IJ element of this uh, shift tensor, roughly speaking, generate the transformation that rotate side I toward the side J. Okay, that's, that's the rough idea. Okay, so here is an example. Um, let's consider the state that has one dimensional local structure like this, the, the say this Gaussian state, where I turn on say TIJ uh, for say on-site term and also some uh, nearest neighbor entanglement bonds. With some strength epsilon, so this this then this state has a one-dimensional local structure like this. Then for this state, it's very natural to choose the mapping from those sides to a one-dimensional manifold, in which this local structure is manifest. So that choice is very simple. In this case, R of J is just J, right? So basically, we we space uh, each side with equal uh, coordinate distance in this one in, in this one dimensional manifold like this, right? Um, and then uh, for this state, now let's consider say this uh, special linear transformation with uh, with a shift tensor y of this form. So as I said, this shift tensor j i element kind of rotate side j to side i, okay? So therefore, if I make this shift tensor to have a non-zero elements when side J and I are nearest neighbor in this one dimensional manifold with the right sign structure so that it prefer one direction over another direction, then this indeed uh, generate the uh, 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 smooth uh, diffeomorphism. I, I should emphasize the active uh, diffeomorphism uh, in the continuum limit, for example, if I apply this transformation to this uh, this uh, matrix, then you can show that uh, to the leading order in the derivative, it 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 uh, it generates this from this uh, there where this shift vector uh, is given by this uh, this uh, this uh, uh, left shift tensor. This shift vector is basically the first moment of this uh, this uh, shift tensor. Okay. Uh, so this this is the generalized uh, spatial diffeomorphism. Now um, we we also need to construct the Hamiltonian uh, constraint. So in in general relativity, the Hamiltonian uh, um, we can we can if, starting from some Cauchy surface, we can we can time evolve uh, you know in a space dependent way by choosing some X dependent lapse function, right? So Hamiltonian comes with a lapse function theta. And then 
basically this labs function transforms as a city under, under special diffeomorphism. So mathematically speaking, the Poisson bracket between momentum, which translate the special diffeomorphism with the Hamiltonian is given by Hamiltonian with the, with the lapse function, which is kind of obtained by dragging your original lapse function along the, along the uh, shift vector C. Okay. And this is also purely kinematic. And then more importantly, uh, in GR, uh, the Poisson bracket between two Hamiltonian is uh, proportional to the, to the uh, uh, spatial diffeomorphism. So the idea, the, the picture is that if you say time evolve your initial state by lapse function theta one, followed by evolution by lapse function theta two, and you reach some final state, you can do in the reverse order. And then you can compare two final state and, and you discover that these two states differ by spatial diffeomorphism with the shift vector, which is given by, of course, those two lapse function. But here, more importantly, there is this structure fact, structure constant is not constant anymore. So it's, it's actually dynamical variable. In particular, the amount of shift that you need to do, say, to compensate these two different orders of evolution is, uh, is de dependent on, say, the signature of your space time and the spatial metric here. Here I've, I've chosen the positive signature for space and then S represent the signature of, of time, okay? So, so this, this dynamical information is encoded in this, in, in this algebra. And this is going to be important for us later. So here, the reason I, I review this is that uh, we want to construct the Hamiltonian which has the similar algebraic structure. Uh, so in particular, we want to construct a Hamiltonian that whose commutator is proportional to the generator of this uh, 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 generalized moment, momentum transformation, okay? And, and this is one, probably this is not the unique, but uh, this is the simplest uh, Hamiltonian that exhibit uh, uh, still non-trivial uh, dynamics. So let's, let's, let's uh, uh, focus on this particular Hamiltonian. So here again, pi is the conjugate momentum to phi. So it's uh, L by M, and then this pi transpose is M by L. So this, this combination is L by L matrix. So this is like a p-square term, like uh, in the kinetic term, and then uh, this alpha is just the order of one constant. It's a parameter of the theory, which you can just set to be one. Then here M square is introduced to make the first term and then second term uh, to be comparable in the large M limit. Okay. And then and then this 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 V is a L by L matrix, uh, which plays the role of uh, lapse function in GR. So uh, and then this lapse, lapse tensor, I call lapse tensor, is a L by L uh, symmetric uh, matrix. And, uh, and then under the frame rotation, under this generalized uh, uh, spatial diffeomorphism, this lapse tensor transforms as a, as a uh, two symmetric, okay? So therefore, you can always choose the frame in which uh, this lab tensor is diagonal. Okay, so, and then it's more convenient to uh, uh, look at the content of this Hamiltonian in that frame. So let, 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 me, let me do that. So let's, let's go to the frame where this, this lab tensor is diagonal. Then this Hamiltonian uh, is written uh, explicitly in the component form like this. Here uh, is sum over all side i and then si is just the diagonal element of the lapse tensor V in this rotated frame. And, and then this, uh, all, all this uh, flavor index ABC are summed over. So first this term, as I said, is a ultra local kinetic term, like a P square term, right? 
And, and then uh, the second term uh, is more interesting. So with, with this only ultra local kinetic term, of course, there's no non trivial dynamics. We need to have some kind of uh, connectivity between, between different sites to have a propagation, propagating mode, right? And that comes from, say, this, this term, say, phi j phi k. And, and then, you know, in the continuum limit, uh, this, this hoping term uh, give rise to gradient term that, that gives um, connectivity between different sites. So in, in usually in the local Hamiltonian, we, we consider, say, non-zero hoping between, say, a predetermined set of links, right? That, that information comes from what dimension you, you want to think about, what is the topology and, and, and geometry, et cetera. But here we don't have uh, we don't have such predetermined uh, geometry dimension topology. So therefore, we do it over all possible sites j and k here. Then it's very non-local. Then you may say, oh, the hoping exists can exist between any two pairs of sites. So it's very non-local. But the point here is that the hoping amplitude, say between site j and k is uh, state dependence. It's, you can view this rest of the term here uh, is the operator that determines the effective hoping amplitude between side J and K. So for example, uh, say if you, if you consider the large flavor, large M limit, then this bilinear is almost classical because uh, the flavor index is large. So you may, to the, to the leading order, you may just replace it with the expectation value of this by, by local object here. And same is true for this object. Then effectively this term can be viewed as a hoping term between side J and K, where the amplitude of hoping between those sides is determined by say expectation value of products of this expectation value of these two bilocal objects between site ij and ki with site i summed over. So let me first uh, explain what, what, what this object is. Again, it's, uh, it's uh, useful, say, to understand what is basically some correlation, right, between site i and j. And you can immediately see that if there's no entanglement or if there's no correlation, this is going to be zero. And only if there's some non-trivial entanglement between Side i and j, this is going to be non-zero. And indeed, if you say compute the expectation value of this object, say for those Gaussian data, I introduced that this expectation value is proportional to the uh, uh, amplitude of the entanglement bond between side i and j. So roughly speaking, this measure, this is a measure of say some entanglement between i and j. This is a measure of entanglement between K and I. And with I summed over, these two product determines the magnitude of hoping between J and K. So pictorially, if you have a side J and K, then the magnitude of hoping between these two sides is determined by how much entanglement these two sides have through some third side I, where I is summed over, right? So I call this, uh, relatively local Hamiltonian as an, as an operator, it's a non-local operator, okay? But uh, it still has sense of, sense of locality because uh, if I apply this Hamiltonian to state which has a local structure, then to the leading order in the large M limit, this Hamiltonian acts like a local Hamiltonian. So that's the, that's, that's the meaning of uh, relatively local. So in other words, the local structure, the, the Hamiltonian itself doesn't, doesn't have a predetermined local structure, but Hamiltonian learns about the local structure from the state. Then when the Hamiltonian is applied to the state, then that Hamiltonian acts like local Hamiltonian um, following the local structure of, of the state, okay? Now, we have, uh, we have a generator for the 
generalized momentum constraint, which is this uh, uh, special linear group generator. And we talked about Newtonian. Now we can we can look at the algebraic structure and uh, this tedious sure. calculation. Yeah. Yeah. So in 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 GR, we usually require these uh, momentum and Hamiltonian constraints to annihilate physical states, right? Like the physical state will be annihilated by these. So That's is right. are these operators also going to annihilate like the physical That's state? Right. Started off with? Yeah. That's right. Oh, okay. Thank you. So these are these are the uh, constraint, right? Yeah. And 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 then for for to be able to have non-trivial state that is annihilated by both momentum and Hamiltonian, what is crucial is that those constraints obey a first cl first class algebra, closed algebra. Okay. So basically, the commutator between them should be proportional to the constraints themselves. So that we don't generate more and more constraints. Uh, so, so that's why we check this uh, commutator and uh, um, commutator between say momentum constraints is purely kinematic, is proportional to the momentum constraint, just as in GR, and say Poisson bracket between momentum is proportional to the momentum. And then commutator between momentum generator and uh, Hamiltonian is proportional to the Hamiltonian. This is again, purely kinematic. It just encodes the fact that this Hamiltonian tensor transforms as a rank two, ten rank two tensor under the SLLR rotation. And this is also similar to the Poisson bracket between momentum and Hamiltonian GR, which is proportional to the Hamiltonian. And then finally, the commutator between two Hamiltonian is proportional to both momentum and Hamiltonian. So first point is that uh, this is exact answer. Now, it's, it is a uh, first point is that it's a first class algebra at the quantum level. Okay, so commutator is proportional to the commutator themselves. So physical states are just defined by state which are annihilated, annihilated by G and H. That's it. We don't need more constraint than that because uh, uh, the, the commutator are proportional to the constraint themselves. But the second thing is that uh, uh, compared to G in, in GR, commutator between Hamiltonian is just proportional to the momentum constraint. But here, uh, uh, you can check that this uh, the term that is proportional to the Hamiltonian is subleading compared to the first term in the in the large n limit. So in the semi-classical limit, we can, we can drop this. So it has the, it has the right uh, kinematic structure uh, that we expect from, from GR. So Sangsa, can I ask another question? Yeah. Um, if, so the, the sort of presumption here is that something has canceled the cosmological constant. Um, and then given that there would be, for example, states that describe gravitons propagating. What would how would such a state appear in this formalism? So I would I would say the cosmological constant is already included in the in this H. Uh, well, if if this is a general theory that includes matter fields and gravity, yeah, you know, there's yeah. some contribution to the CC. Yeah. Um. In you know, if this boils down to effective field theory, which I think you're saying it does because of local the locality property that you build in. Yeah. You know, then it has that aspect to it, which you know could be canceled either by some kind of tuning or by some excessive use of supersymmetry or something. Um, uh, so I'm I was just imagining that's been done, and then um, on top of that, there would be so the kind of state you might want to study would be one in which uh, the locality is realized via you know, the sta standard uh, propagation and interaction of gravitational waves, for example. So I'm just trying to understand how that would appear in this, uh, in this language. Right, so uh, I guess, uh, yeah, so in, in the end, the, so I will say a few more words on effective theory later, once we find some set point. Uh, and, but uh, in general, the theory has a 
many, many propagating modes, not just the spin to uh, gravitational mode, but higher spin mode as well, and a lot of uh, matter fields as well. So, and, and uh, all of them will contribute to the cosmological constant. And uh, to realize a weakly curved uh, set point solution, presumably we need some fine tuning of uh, at least initial state. Um, uh, but um, yeah, so, yeah, that, that's, that's uh, uh, and, and then, um, and then what if, what, what is the effective theory? So, um, so that, that will, that will come after we first find some, uh, some set point configuration, and then we can consider some small fluctuation around the, around the set point. And in the end, it will turn out that uh, some effective theory is some kind of bilocal field theory. And, and then it can be viewed as a uh, infinite tower of uh, higher spin fields um, propagating in the space time set by some set point configuration. Um, oh, I, I see, so it's not meant to get to a large radius space in the usual sense we mean it with, uh, without such higher spin fields. Is it more like the large flavor versions of ADS-CFT or, or something? Yeah, here I guess uh, the, my, my first goal is to have some well-defined uh, quantum gravity and uh, um, and try to understand whatever the consequence it, it uh, gives. Uh, and uh, pro yeah, I, I, probably this particular model without fine tuning doesn't give, um, give a weakly curved space. That's my guess. Uh, without, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's right. Oh, oh, okay, thanks. J j by the way, just since you keep saying it, the um, it's also true, it also happens to be true in string theory that the dimensionality and the topology are not preordained. Um, those are, in fact, you could say, uh, an aspect of the state, not the theory. And in fact, there's fun dualities that relate the two and dynamical changes of both dimensionality and topology. So um, of course it's a more elaborate theory than the one you're trying to construct here. So uh, that was just mm -hmm. a comment. Okay. Okay, okay so um, now, so the, and then um, this, this uh, quantum constraint algebra uh, eventually we want to ask if this has anything to do with the, uh, say, the constraint algebra of GR, the hypersurface deformation algebra that the uh, momentum and Newtonian constraint obey. So to make those comparison, uh, we have to think about some state which has a local structure. Then, you know, state that has a local structure, we can choose the mapping from this side into a, a manifold. And then we can ask how this momentum and Hamiltonian generators are represented in that, in that manifold, right? And here I, I, I'm not explaining the detail, it's a rather long technical calculation, but here is the claim. So this, uh, this quantum, uh, committee, the, this uh, quantum algebra of constraint reduces to the um, to the hypersurface deformation algebra of GR to the leading order in the plus uh, generators of higher spin symmetry, provided I identify the say momentum density and Hamiltonian density in terms of the generator of the SLLR transformation and this Hamiltonian matrix like this. And I, I identify the, the shift factor and the lapse function in terms of the shift tensor and the lapse tensor in this way. Uh, and there's also one, there's one 
further condition, which is kind of uh, most important one, which is that um, uh, this, the requirement that I, I reproduce, so in order to reproduce this uh, algebra in GR, I have to identify the, the spatial metric times the signature to be given by some uh, 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 second moment for, for this uh, rank six tensor that appear in the commutator for the Hamiltonian constraint. So, so it, it was a very long statement, right? So, so uh, to summarize, uh, um, one can identify the momentum density in the in 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 the in in, in the continuum limit by from from this generator of this SLR transformation, um, and and then this Hamiltonian density is just given by the diagonal elements of those um, Hamiltonian matrix, and and then. Uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, the, the Poisson bracket between two Hamiltonian is uh, proportional to the momentum with this uh, shift vector. And this shift vector depends not only on the, the, the lapse function, but also on this uh, metric and signature of, of, of space, uh, of the time. And, 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 and then now here, the constraint, the commutator between two Hamiltonian is proportional to the momentum to the leading order with this uh, with this tensor. So roughly speaking, we have to identify this object with uh, with the, the the metric that appears between the Poisson bracket between uh, uh, that appeared in the Poisson bracket between the Hamiltonian constraint in GI. So that's why we want to identify the spatial metric and the signature from, from this, this tensor that, that appear here. And this tensor here, C, is a rather complicated combination of the underlying dynamical degrees freedom. And this, this particular combination is the one that determines, determines the uh, spatial metric in order for, for for this theory to be comparable with, with GR in, in, the, in the long distance limit. So that, that's the, that's the uh, rough idea. Uh, but, but I should say this, this is something that you can, you can uh, derive uh, mathematically once you have a, once you have a mapping uh, uh, from the side to, to a manifold then within that manifold, you can do the gradient expansion, et cetera. And then this is something you can derive. And okay, so now uh, having specified the, the gauge symmetry of the, of the system, now we can uh, talk about some dynamics uh, that follows from the, from the gauge symmetry. So, as uh, as Onkar mentioned, you know, um, physical states uh, are annihilated by by the uh, the generators of the gauge symmetry in, in in say say in the Wheeler Dewey equation, right? Um, but the but the non-trivial dynamical information is actually encoded in the correlation between say physical degrees freedom generated along the gauge orbit. So for example, in the Hamiltonian ADN picture of uh, GR, you start from some uh, Cauchy, initial Cauchy data, then you evolve that Cauchy data forward and backward uh, using Hamiltonian. Of course, that Hamiltonian evolution is purely the gauge transformation, but along the gauge orbit, you are, uh, uh, coordinate and momentum, the metric, spatial metric and the momentum evolve, right? And then you can um, ask what correlations are being generated, say between the size of the universe compared with some scalar field. And then these correlations are the, the, the physical content, dynamical content of, of the theory. So we can, we can do the same thing here. So uh, it can be most easily done 
Uh, so the Hilbert space, the full Hilbert space is huge, right? So therefore, um, to to make the analysis simple, you can impose some flavor symmetry in your state, and once and you can choose this. But once you fix your flavor symmetry, then it uh, it uh, determines the sub Hilbert space within the full Hilbert space uh, that respect that flavor symmetry. And then if you if you uh, prepare your initial state, which is equivalent to preparing your Cauchy data in some initial time slice within this uh, within this uh, sub Hilbert space, then you can ask how the how the say Hamiltonian evolved this state within this manifold. Okay, and and then um, within this uh, sub Hilbert space. You can identify a set of uh, collective variables uh, that that span this uh, sub Hilbert space, and then uh, also um, another nice property of this is that in the large M limit, those collective variables become classical. So you can, at least in the large M limit, you can you, you can study the semi-classical uh, dynamics. Um, uh, and then include, say, uh, quantum fluctuation uh, order by order in, in one over n. So this is what we can do. For example, you can you can start with the uh, initial state that has a three-dimensional local structure, say with um, with um, torus three torus topology. Okay, here I have drawn some example where. Each side here, rep each each vertex represents the side, and then this say this is the this link is the entanglement bond. So it has uh, some discrete translational invariance, and it has the um, discrete rotational symmetry and uh, reflection symmetry, etc. Okay. And then now, and then yeah, and and then uh uh. This state, um, we can we can evolve what kind of uh, state this uh, flows under under this uh, Hamiltonian evolution, and here is what we have. So um, because of the translation invariance and then discrete rotation symmetry, actually the spatial metric is uh, fully parameterized by just one single scale factor a, as far as the metric spin two uh, metric is compared. Concern. And then, of course, there are other scalar fields and then other higher spin fields, which I'm not plotting here. And this 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 plot shows the evolution of the scale factor with respect to the parameter time along the along the gauge uh, along the Hamiltonian evolution. Okay. And and then uh, on the right here, it it plots the signature of time. So actually, even the signature is the dynamical variable here. So it it uh, um, it evolves. So you start from say initial state that has a, a Euclidean signature with uh, say small small size, and then um, as as time evolves, the the size of the Euclidean space kind of diverges at some critical time. Followed by a uh, new space time, which has now Lorentzian signature, starting from a very big size, so which I draw here. And then uh, it, it, uh, it, as time evolves, it reaches some minimum and then it's expand again to infinity. So this, this, this uh, interval here in the parameter time represents one epoch of. Uh, this the like space time with the Lorentzian signature. And then it undergoes uh, another phase transition into um, Euclidean space with positive signature. And then, and then the, the, the Lorentzian space time appear again. So this kind of series of uh, distal space uh, sandwiched by the Euclidean spaces. So this is one solution. Uh, that I obtained by starting from an initial state with a three-dimensional uh, local structure with uh, with uh, with a uh, 
uh, translation invariance. Um, and so, and then um, what happens at this transition, at this, at this critical time where the signature changes and the size of the universe uh, diverge, these critical points are, are rather interesting. So, uh, so what happens here is that, uh, so on the right-hand side here, I'm plotting uh, uh, so-called um, entanglement bond dispersion or spectrum. So here, so here Tij is one collective variable, for example, that measures the entanglement between site I and J, right? For example, in the Gaussian state that I talked about, Tij is the uh, L by L matrix that measures the, whose off diagonal elements measures the entanglement between I and J. Now, in the presence of uh, translation invariance, Tij is just function of, say, Ri minus Rj, where Ri is the image of site I in the Riemannian manifold, and Rj is the image of site J, right? And then the translation invariance depends on the, on the relative coordinate between I and J, right? And then it's convenient to look at this uh, free mode. Uh, and then this is it's a function of K, right? And then here is the plot of this uh, free mode of the collective variable as a function of say K1 in the first direction, the momentum, okay? Now, Say if you start from here somewhere, this is the red curve, right? And then uh, as 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 we evolve forward, uh, this it ev evolves into this next curve, etc. So here, um, um, uh, the curvature of this curve near k equals zero is roughly what determines the 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 metric. The the intuition is the following. So when Tij is ultra, ultra local, it, 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 it has only on site term, right? Then obviously, this free transform, free transformation will not have any k dependence at all, right? In that case, this object will be flat, right? That's when it is ultra local. So then every sites are kind of uh, decoupled from each other, and the distance between all sites are infinitely large. So this kind of space is fragmented into decoupled site. But now when Tij acquires some little bit of uh, connectivity, then this begins to depends on K, right? Then that's the dispersion. So, and then the longer the range of the entanglement, the stronger the K dependence is going to be for this, right? That's why this coverture, how, how strongly this object depends on K, determines how far different sites are entangled. And that determines the notion of the proper distance, right? If, you, if the range of entanglement is long in the coordinate distance, that, that means that the proper distance is short because you can connect between two sites using only few few entanglement bands, right? And then as you can see here, as time increases, the, this uh, dispersion becomes flatter and flatter. So that's why here, as, as time evolves, the size of the universe becomes bigger and bigger, right? And then at this critical time, what happens is that this uh, coverture vanishes. The, the band itself is not completely flat, so at this critical time, but uh, at the quadratic order near k equals zero, two derivative vanishes. So that's the, that's the uh, critical time. That's when, when the size of the universe diverges. So roughly speaking, the metric is determined by the, the two derivative of this uh, uh, spectrum near, near k equals zero. And then as you go to the other side of the transition, when the, when the signature of space-time become Euclidean, then it become uh, uh, locally, concave instead of being local, locally convex, right? So this uh, local coverture, sign of the local coverture of this entanglement dispersion determines the signature and the uh, magnitude of this uh, uh, dispersion near k equals zero coverture determines the, the, the uh, uh, 
scale of, of, the, of the universe in this case. And then here, one point that I want to convey is that uh, it is true that the pattern of entanglement determines the metric here, but the converse is not true um, because the geometry is only very, a small part of the information about how the, the sites are entangled. For example, at this critical point, right? The second moment, the two derivative is zero, but still this, uh, this entanglement dispersion is not flat. There's a still K dependence. Therefore, the sites are still entangled, right? So this means that there, there are entanglements still that are not captured geometrically. Maybe it's captured by some higher moments, maybe some higher spin uh, object in this case. Okay. So, um, so it, I think maybe this is obvious, but uh, the pattern of entanglement has much more information than, than geometry itself. Okay, so um, so let me let me uh, conclude. So. Uh, so uh, here I, I talked about a, a uh, background independent theory where of gravity where um, dimension topology and geometry are all collective variables of uh, some matrix quantum matter. And, uh, and uh, uh, it seems that uh, at least to the leading order in the derivative expansion, um, this theory has the same gauge structure as the uh, as GR. Probably it's uh, much larger than GR. There are many higher spin fields. And then I didn't talk about the um, I didn't write down the low energy effective theory. But now once you have this uh, classical background solution, now you can add the uh, small fluctuation and then write down the effective theory. In this case, the uh, the excitation that that propagate the propagating degrees freedoms are the fluctuations of those collective variables. For example, this this tij this is the collective variable, bilocal collective variable, which is uh, dynamical, and then this tij has a set point, like uh, that determines this uh, set point solution, and then small fluctuation around the set point become propagating mode. So this is what is represented here. So this, it depends on this, uh, it's a bilocal object that, that, that can propagate in this, um, say, distal space. And uh, it, it includes uh, spin two modes and then higher spin fields as well. Um, okay, yeah, so let, let, me, let me stop. If you have any question or comments, then, then I will be happy to try to answer. Thanks a lot, Sansek, for the very nice talk. Let's applaud for Sansek. Um, do, are there any questions? Well, I, I could ask one more, which is just, you have this time that goes from an entire Decider evolution to a more abstract Euclidean version or something. Um, are you thinking of that as some sort of contour in the complex time plane or something like this? Because, uh, you know, the, the obvious question is, what, what does it mean? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think you can think that way. Um, here, of course, the tau is real gauge parameter along the gauge orbit generated by the Hamiltonian constraint. And uh, from, from this uh, matter point of view, from the quantum mechanical underlying matrix quantum mechanics point of view, this transition is nothing but some Lipschitz transition where the band uh, got inverted. And, and then the sign of the coverture is the one that determines the relative signature between time and space. So it's like uh, some kind of uh, 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 
cartooning mode in some sense. You 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 have a you have a dispersion in in, in as a function of k change the sign across this uh, across this transition, and that that creates this signature change. So it's a, it's a well-defined, say, dynamical quantum phase transition from the perspective of underlying quantum mode. Um, um, but so actually a related question. So um, if, uh, if I look at the two curves on the right side, like one, like the top one and the bottom one, with the opposite sign of the second of the k square term, uh, it seems. I mean, if I think of a picture like a one D chain, um, the Fourier transform. The, you go back to the real space. The the term that that has the opposite sign of k square is also decaying. It's just that we're having an alternating. Sign. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Both both are decaying exponentially. So so it's not like I'm changing the geometry from. I mean, I mean, like from the, in the set, like if I calculate the entanglement, like mutual information between two sides, it will behave yeah. similarly. That's right. You're, you're right. Yeah, that's right. Does that mean there should be a different measure that uh, so mutual information? The second moment? Can, yeah, so mutual information depends only on the absolute value of right. here. Yeah, it's like basically a square of the, yeah. of, of the one function, norm square. That's right. Approximately. Yeah. yeah. And and you're right. So it, in real space, both decays exponentially. Um, so it's kind I mean, of, like, I mean, do you really have any divergence, or is it just because this particular second derivative diverges? But, but like, like if I it, it it become kind of ultra local at the critical point, right? Because it's kind of dispersionless near k equals zero. Of course, it's not fully flat band, but near k equals zero. The the quadratic term, two derivative term vanishes. So, so and and that corresponds to the that a uh, locally flattening. So become much short, kind of become shortest range in real space. And that's when the size of the space diverges. Mm -hmm. But even then, the entanglement is not completely lost because it's not completely ultra local. Mm -hmm. And and just to confirm, so that um, um, we you always you always have a continuous time. Yeah. So um, we're well, here. Tau is the parameter time, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and um, and of course, we have to measure, say, the evolution of the scale factor with respect to other physical observers, say some scalar field, et cetera. And they, at, at least in the large and classical limit, they evolve continuously. So, I mean, so the theory should be diffeomorphism environment, even if one of the directions you treat uh, um, differently, because like there is one time direction which is continuous. So, the, in the, in, yeah, in the same way that in GR, in the Hamiltonian formalism, uh, this algebra of GR guarantees that uh, there is a, a four-dimensional space-time diffeomorphism, although we break into three plus one D. So in, in, the, in that sense, you have uh, space-time diffeomorphism here. Is there a, sorry, uh, maybe I should, <laughs> I have asked uh, many questions, but um, so is, is there a solution that uh, corresponds to like a, a black hole with the interior? I mean, I'm curious, like what kind of solution that uh, corresponds to like some going to singularity or that kind of thing? Yeah, I haven't, uh, I don't know, but my guess is that um, in, in principle, you can have a non-local structure where by local phase Tij become say Paolo decaying. And, and, and then you don't have uh, any 
well-defined local geometry, but you still have some some structure. Maybe maybe that that's what was was behind beyond the horizon. But I'm, that's 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 my my guess. But you can you can certainly think about states like that. From that's that they are well-defined state. Somehow it becomes longer longer correlated along some directions, but not in other directions. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, are there any other questions? Yeah, I, I have a question, sorry. I, I couldn't re really follow all, all the details, but I have a big picture question, which is in this formalism, would it, do you think it would be eventually possible to incorporate a massless spin to graviton? Like what about the, the, the spectrum of the particles in this? Yeah. Um, so I don't know the answer yet. So I couldn't find any static uh, solution yet. So I, I was not yet able to do the, um, I was not able to find good time variable against which I, I extract the physical spectrum yet. Um, so the short answer is I don't know, but uh, maybe less satisfactory answer is there is a in principle way to proceed. Again, the way to proceed is that you find some set point solution for the collective variable and then um, you, you um, consider a small fluctuation and then and you, you study say the dynamics of those propagating mode and, mm -hmm. and, and, and then uh, if that, that's, that's and then you can you can do the you can you can extract the spectrum. So, but here, um, what what are the content of the massless degrees freedom at long distance uh, depends on what kind of state you 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 consider. It it, it basically depends on your your reference uh, set point solution, right? So here the gauge symmetry is very large, much larger than say diffeomorphism, right? Because this generator of generalized diffeomorphism includes much non-local transformation. So in order to have like a general relative limit, you have to hix many of those uh, extra extra gauge field, right? So so and and then what? How many how many degrees freedom you hix? I guess that requires choosing the right right uh, kind of vacuum state or, or the set point set point uh, state. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Well, if not, uh, let's thank Sangsek again. Uh, thanks a lot, Sangsek, for the, the, the very nice talk. Uh, let me stop recording. Okay.